This was a conversation with the investigative journalist Tom O'Neill. 22 years ago, he started writing a piece about the 30th anniversary of the Manson killings, but he uncovered one of the most complete accounts of the secret war of the 1960s, including links to the Kennedy assassination, the CIA mind control project MKUltra, and much more, which he talked about in an influential interview on Joe Rogan last year. The motive, though, to get back to the oh, motive. The motive, yeah. For the so the tape. official motive was a double. I mean, Bugliosi said in his closing arguments that uh, the, the main motive was to ignite Helter Skelter right, race right. war. The sub motive was to instill fear in Terry Melcher because he had rejected Manson. Right. So you're saying, well, then if it wasn't those, then what was it? Right. All right. If you look at the Co COINTEL Pro objectives, which was to. to um, diminish the, you know, to neutralize the left-wing movement, to make them look horrible, evil, bad, and this is what drugs are going to do to your kids. Um, the kind of outcome that this, this, these murders had was to make the hippies the boogeyman. I mean, the biggest boogeyman in, in United States history. In this conversation, we talked about what this secret war means for America and whether the country can move on until the full history of those times is brought into the light. The FBI's COINTELPRO and the CIA's Operation Chaos were both two uh, projects that were begun in 1967. Both initially began in San Francisco during the same season, the spring of 67, that Manson had been released from federal prison in Los Angeles. And during that period, Chaos, the CIA operation, had been begun, like COINTELPRO, to neutralize what the pretty much the tops of the federal government of the United States believed was a coming revolution, you know, a, a youth revolution. Uh, and, and they considered the kind of center point, the boiling over point for all that, to be the Bay Area. Tom is a fascinating guy, and I hope you enjoy the film. So, Tom O'Neill, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. So, you're an investigative journalist. You're the author of this book, Chaos, The Truth Behind the Manson Murders. And I saw you on an amazing podcast on Joe Rogan, where you talked about the book and the process of creating the book and the amazing 20-year journey that you went on right. and what you uncovered. Um, I'm... I'm going to sort of summarize a little bit of what came through and that I'd really advise people to go and watch that Joe Rogan podcast because I think you you did an amazing deep dive into the evidence there and we'll try and cover some new topics here or some some new sure. parts to get to but also we'll we'll obviously have to recap some of the some of the kind of basics of the case as well. Um I'll I'll start by saying when people ask you to summarize the book what you immediately kind of think oh no I, that's impossible. Yeah, yeah, but then I say uh, it's a revisitation of the Manson murders and kind of leave it at that. And I said it turns up a lot of unexpected uh, information. Mm. That's about as far as you can go because it's too hard to synopsize. What, what I found absolutely fascinating about it and also about your performance on that because you were very measured, you were very careful, you were very clear to say what you had evidence for, what you, when you were going into the realms of speculation. But a lot of the topics that you're talking about are, they're, they're the center of a lot of kind of alternative histories of conspiracy right. theories. Um, you go into the CIA's mind control project, MKUltra, you touch on the Kennedy assassination, a lot of the kind of anti-subversive projects of like the FBI, were running during the, the 60s, what I would summarize as kind of the undeclared war against the counterculture. That you get a real sense of uncovering as you kind of go through the book. Right. Um, what I'd love to start with is how was that process for you as someone who was effectively, you were commissioned to do a, an, a, a story about the, the anniversary of the Manson killings, and then you started uncovering all of this stuff, not expecting it. How what was it like for you to kind of find yourself in this territory? And well, did think, you worry about that? Yeah, I think unconsciously that might have been what worked so well to the book when it finally was published was I was learning everything about those 
agencies and, and projects that you just mentioned for the first time. And I describe through the book narrative my kind of stumbling down those rabbit holes and at first discovering that they existed, but doubting it, and then trying to find out more information. So I think the reader kind of experience from what I've heard, experiences what I experienced when I discovered it for the first time. And originally, the first publisher of the book wanted it um, written in the third person, not in the first. And I did too. I agree. I didn't want myself to be a character in it. But as it, the investigations, my investigation went on and I found there were more and more loose ends that I might not ever be able to tie up, that the only way to tell those stories was to insert myself in the narrative. So I would use the scenes in the narrative because if you couldn't prove something happened a certain way, uh, the closest you can get is catching these people in lies. It's really difficult to tell that. I don't know if you're right, but in the third person, uh, without yourself and your voice in there reacting and, and having the exchange. So I think in the end, uh, the book kind of became as much a chronicle of my journey to becoming aware of this stuff that I didn't know about, this secret history. Uh, and I think that might be what works well, not that it was planned that way, but uh, for the reader to discover the stuff for the first time. And where would you say you've ended up at the conclusion of the process? Pretty cynical, <laughs> you know, a lot more skeptical of official histories, official narratives. I mean, I was always, you know, I was a journalist, mostly entertainment, but I did some crime reporting. So I knew that, you know, there was a lot of skullduggery and stuff, but um, much more cynical than I was when I started out and much less trusting of any kind of authority. Yeah, and I'll maybe sort of just summarize the, the the Manson aspect of the story, and just let me know if you if you'd agree with with this mm -hmm. summary. Um, I'd I'd say that what you discovered was that Manson was almost certainly protected, uh, potentially informant, or even potentially an agent provocateur for certain aspects of government agencies linked to many of the secret projects that were aimed at infiltrating and subverting the revolutionary potent, potential of the counterculture. Right. That's good. Would that, would that yeah. be a good good summary? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could never find a piece of paper, you know, a document from that period stating that. And you know, I was told that that stuff isn't on paper. But the closest I got to proving that was a circumstantial case of evidence showing that every time he was arrested, he would be automatically released. Charges would be dropped. His parole wouldn't be violated. I was able to find out that his parole officer was, you know, involved with these pretty shadowy government agencies at the same time. And then I got people who were in law enforcement at the time, uh, particularly from district attorney's offices who, who prosecuted these cases. And one in particular, a very well-known Los Angeles uh, deputy DA who ended up becoming the, the head criminal judge for Van Nuys, Lou Watnick who went over all the documents. And at first he was like me, he was skeptical that any of this was gonna add up to anything. But after he went through everything I'd uncovered about Manson and put all this paperwork in front of him, as I write in the book, he just said, uh, <laughs> he called it all chicken shit. He said, this is all chicken shit. He said, they should have had him in and behind bars, but he was much more valuable to somebody on the outside than the inside. And then he kind of, I think this was like the first or second year of my reporting. And I said, well, who? And he said, I don't know. That's for you to find out. He said it could have been federal, you know, FBI, CIA. It could have been local, you know, LAPD, sheriffs. Uh, could have been a number of, of agencies, but he definitely was protected by someone because he was valuable to them. So uh, that's kind of uh, the journey the book goes on to is then I left that meeting to try to find out who. And, and, and then I started finding shadowy figures that had kind of been around Manson. I don't know if the, the word enabling might be too generous, uh, but let's just say they weren't stopping him from what he was doing. And they had connections to the government. And this was all just in one to two years between 67 and the crimes in 69 that all this stuff happened. Mm, yeah, it, that's one of the amazing things is just how short a period we're talking about. Yeah. And when you say connections to government, you're talking specifically about some of these um, 
secret projects that only were emer- emerged and were sort of confirmed in the 70s, I think. Could you could you yeah, kind of outline yeah. some of those? Because we're talking about MK Ultra, we're talking about COINTEL Pro and and chaos. So in 67, well, let's see. Let's keep MK Ultra on the shelf for a minute. Uh, F, uh, FBI's COINTEL Pro and the CIA's Ca- Operation Chaos were both two uh, projects that were begun in 1967. Both initially began in San Francisco during the same season, the spring of 67, that Manson had been released from federal prison in Los Angeles and immediately violated his parole and went right up to the Bay Area and then was assigned to this um, federal parole officer, Roger Smith, who I write extensively about in the book and interview. Um, And during that period, chaos, the CIA operation, had been begun, like COINTELPRO, to neutralize what the pretty much the tops of the federal government of the United States believed was a coming revolution, you know, a, a youth revolution. Uh, and, and they considered the kind of center point, the boiling over point for all that, to be the Bay Area. Uh, the, the free speech movement began there in 62, 63. That kind of um, morphed into the anti-war movement, you know, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and got bigger and then spread throughout the United States. But in 67 was where, you know, the Black Panthers had, had, had become much more um, effective in, in their battle against racism, and, and they were also becoming violent. So everything kind of began there, and then Chaos and COINTELPRO moved to other cities. Chicago. I mean, they established offices in other cities. The Chaos program was completely illegal because the, the um, CIA is not allowed to operate domestically. So from the start, that was an illegal program. COINTELPRO was illegal just in the fact that they were wiretapping without warrants, they were spying, uh, they were actually provoking, as you said, Asian provocateurs, they were provoking uh, Panthers and their rival groups to commit crimes against one another that they hoped would result in, in death and murder, and it actually did. This, the CIA program, COINTELPRO, was exposed in, I think, 73 or 74 when a bunch of files were stolen by activists in Pennsylvania and released to the press, showing um, this uh, really, you know, horribly frightening domestic surveillance and, and agitation operation by the government. And, and once the FBI was confronted with it and there were hearings, they admitted to it. And I think they ended up taking responsible responsibility for somewhere between 20 and 30 violent deaths that had been provoked by them. And, and that was the purpose of what, what, why COINTELPRO began was to either kill the leaders of these groups and or have them commit that they could be caught and then put to prison. They really wanted them to kill each other because their groups all had rival factions, even within the Panthers. And we, we put MKUltra on the back burner but that's one yeah. of the <laughs> That's a crazier one. Yeah, so MK Ultra kind of, when the OSS, uh, which was a United States intelligence overseas operation during World War II, the spying operation, once World War II was ended in, in the late 40s, the CIA was born out of the OSS, Office of Strategic Services. And um, once the United States government learned that the Soviets and the Chinese had developed what they believed was a technology to brainwash people using hypnotism, drugs, isolation, sensory deprivation. The CIA uh, decided that they needed to learn how that was being done overseas so they could prevent it from happening to Americans, particularly captured, you know, Americans who were fighting wars, you know, pilots and that, that kind of thing. So they started something called Artichoke, Bluebird, and then by 1951 to 52, what had begun as a defensive program was reoriented to become uh, from defensive to offensive, to learn how to use that technology against our enemies. They turned it on, their, uh, on the American population. They started using drugs and experiments on um, in the early days. They had safe houses in San Francisco and New York where prostitutes working as 
for the CIA would um, seduce or bring Johns to apartments that were outfitted with two way or with one way mirrors where they could be filmed and the prostitutes would dose these guys with LSD. You know, when the guys figured out what happened, they weren't about to charge anyone or go to the police because they were committing an illegal act. And then they started testing on the youth population, you know, first student volunteers, and then they would go out and all that's detailed in the book, but that was entirely on Eagle because they're giving, you know, mind-blowing drugs to people without their knowledge or consent. And that all got exposed in 73 through 75 and in government hearings. And again, the public was just like I was. They were apprehensive when the first reports came out by a journalist named Seymour Hirsch. But, you know, it's on the front page of the New York Times and the, the Congress held hearings and the CIA had to admit that they had this secret illegal operation for about 20 some years at that point. But they also destroyed all the records of it and they weren't able to ever really be prosecuted for it or even held accountable. They admitted that they had done this, but they wouldn't they wouldn't say who they did it to, where it happened. They minimized it. And they also said that uh, it had been ineffective and they, they wanted the world to think that the whole thing was a crazy lark. Uh, and, and what I found out was quite the contrary. It had been effective and they had learned, they had achieved a lot of the original goals of the program. You know, the main goal was to create programmed assassins, people who would kill without any conscious or memory of being programmed and have either no recollection after or no, no remorse. That just, you know, brainwashed soldiers, the famous Manchurian candidate book and movie uh, presents a pretty good fictional depiction of it, but a lot of it I don't think is fictional. Mm. Yeah, and you, you make this real in the book with the, by talking about, I think it's Jolly West. Yeah. Who, who is, you managed to find some evidence that, he, he'd always denied being part of this project, but you now find right. evidence that not only was he part of it, he was effectively kind of confirming that he had done a lot of these, these yeah. experiments and and that some of them have been successful. Is that is that fair enough? He died about I think six months before the reporting, and he didn't figure at all in my original investigation because I didn't know what MKUltra was or that it existed. It was only within a year and a half that I had started focusing on how Manson had learned to control these people to the point that they would go out and kill complete strangers just because he told them to and have no remorse for it. Um, and that led me to the discovery through, you know, there is a public record of MK Ultra, and then these allegations against this one doctor, Jolly West, who um, his real name was Lewis West. Uh, I found out that he had been working, doing recruiting subjects, for this program and out of the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic in 67, which is where Manson went with the girls during the period that he kind of transformed into this, from this illiterate kind of con man, 32, 33 years old, into this guru who had a following of within a year, about 30, 40, 50 people who would do anything he told them to do. And um, West died that 97, and up until his death, Anytime anybody said that uh, accused him of being involved in this program, he denied it. And there was never any proof and he got away with it. Long story short, after his death, I got access to his papers and, you know, search for a needle in the haystack. It took a whole summer in a special collections at the last university. He was at UCLA and I found these letters dating to 1952-53 between Sidney Gottlieb, who was the head of the, the CIA scientist who started um, MKUltra with. Then, then director Alan Dulles and West not only was a part of it, but he was a principal kind of engineer of how they were going to conduct the experiments, how they were going to conceal them from colleagues, from the patients. And in some of the early really chilling letters, he talked about inducing uh, amnesias in people and sanities in people without their knowledge. And by 1955, two or three years after he started, there was a letter to Gottlieb announcing that he had learned to um, successfully remove true memories from a subject uh, and replace them with false memories that were permanent and the subject would have no recollection of being tampered with. And that was really the, the, 
CIA needed that more than anything else than to go on and, and, and take these experiments out into the field, which is what West also said, that he needed to take the experiments out into the field. At that point, he was you know, administering drugs mostly to um, people at Lackland Air Force Base, you know, uh, it, it, airmen who had committed you know, little crimes and were in, in the brig or something. And uh, he said he wanted to take it out in the field and do it on human subjects without their knowledge. And this is sort of a leading question because I know what my answer to this is. Um, what was the most astonishing thing that you discovered during your research? Because I'm thinking that the Jack Ruby link, which links to what you were just just saying, was the the, the piece that really blew me away. <laughs> that blew me away too. Yeah, and that was kind of I wasn't excited, you know, because uh, I was trying to keep my focus just on the Manson case and and those crimes. But then when I went into the history of West, and again, this was all public record, he had uh, treated Jack Ruby after Jack Ruby, who I don't know how many people in, you're in the UK, right? Know who yeah. he was, but um, he was the the man who shot the Harvey Oswald to death, who was the um, accused assassin of, of President John F. Kennedy in, in the basement of the Dallas police headquarters, just walked right up to him and shot him to death. Um, Ruby never gave a couple different excuse or reasons for why he killed Oswald through his attorney. And the first was that he wanted to keep Jackie Kennedy from having to come to Dallas for a murder trial because she would have to testify it since she was sitting next to her husband when he was killed. Um, he, the lawyer later admitted he made that up. So there was no reason ever given. Ruby wouldn't talk after he was convicted. Um, his lawyer was able to get an appeal. He fired that lawyer, got another lawyer. And right before he was going to start talking and actually testify to the Warren Commission, Jolly West materialized out of nowhere, went to examine him and uh, left his um, jail cell and had a press conference and said within the preceding 48 hours, Jack Ruby had had a psychotic break from which he would never recover that he was presently having um, auditory and visual hallucinations that he hid under a table because he thought there were people in the room trying to kill him. He told Wes that there were Jews being boiled alive outside prison walls. Um, and if you look at the letters that I reproduce in my book, and uh, you'll see that that was one of the main goals of West's early work was to induce insanity in a person without their, their knowledge. And it looks like when, when Ruby finally testified to the Warren Commission about six months later, they couldn't use anything he said because he was rambling incoherently. And he never recovered from that psychosis. He died about two and a half years later. Uh, and the circumstances surrounding his death, you know, this onset of very fast acting cancer are also kind of interesting. I don't go into them in my book, but maybe part two. Yeah, I mean, just to recap why that was so extraordinary, I mean, Jack Ruby, that, that was always the most peculiar thing about the Kennedy assassination anyway, the thing that just didn't seem to make sense was why would Jack Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald? Like, right. what possible motive was it apart from silencing a potential a potential witness? And then what what was fascinating about your analysis, and I reread that section of the book actually this morning, and you you were very you also talk about that there were people even at the time who were suspicious of of what had happened, that actually there were other there were other people who yeah. questioned what had happened with so so this guy, Jolly West, just happens to be assigned to him. He has the psychotic break. And yeah. it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It's not like you're the one making up that, oh, there might have been something peculiar yeah, yeah, about yeah. this. Even at the time, people were saying this this doesn't make sense. Well, there was another psychiatrist who was very well known who was asked by the judge to provide a second opinion. So he examined um, Ruby, you know, within days of this psychotic break. And I found his report actually in West Files to the judge. And he said um, his immediate uh, suspicion was that Ruby was faking it. And he said, but it was so compelling 
but he said he didn't understand because he examined all of the previous, because Ruby was examined by like six psychiatrists for the first trial, and none of them talked about any like delusional behavior or disassociation, hallucinations, none of that stuff. So he said that was his first uh, suspicion was that he would fake it, but he he concluded that he wasn't faking it. He said, my second would be that somebody had gotten to Ruby and somehow given him some type of agent. Now, they didn't know what LSD was unless he was working for the CIA at the time, because this was 1964, 65, and LSD was only really known at that point within military uh, and, and federal experimental programs. But he said, uh, but because Ruby was so protected, he couldn't imagine anybody getting in there to give him some type of agent to do this to him. And also that it had been fixed. It wasn't like a temporary thing. And that's, again, exactly what Wes did. He went in and saw Ruby alone. There was nobody else in the cell with him. And he said in 52 and 53, that was what the CIA wanted him to do, contracted him to do originally because they wanted to do this type of thing to foreign leaders, you know, that were enemies. They wanted to get somebody in there to even try to get somebody to do this to Castro with a, a, a cigar that had LSD on the end of it. Um, so even more importantly, I think, is showing not just the, you know, the circumstantial evidence that Wes did this to Ruby, but uh, more importantly was that Wes boss, at the CIA from 1952 to 53, his three bosses were Alan Dulles, uh, Richard Helms, who took over for Dulles um, about two years after, no, three years after Dulles was fired by John Kennedy and Sidney Gottlieb. So the Warren Commission was comprised of Alan Dulles, who, who was selected by uh, uh, Chief Justice Warren, 13 men on the commission to investigate this assassination. Dulles knew who West was and what he was capable of. Richard Helms, who later became the director, um, was the liaison between the CIA and the Warren Commission to provide information. Nobody disclosed to the Warren Commission that one of the psychiatrists, not only the psychiatrists who examined West, because there were about a dozen, but the one who examined him, the, you know, within 48 hours of him having a psychotic break, actually worked for the CIA you know, experimenting and researching and trying to accomplish exactly what happened to Jack Ruby. None of that was disclosed. It would have changed everything um, if they knew that a, a CIA agent, more, I mean, he was a contracted agent of the CIA, had gotten in there to Ruby right before Ruby was going to testify under oath and scrambled his brain. Yeah, I mean, it's that, that was the, the most extraordinary piece of evidence. What, mm -hmm. what did, how did that feel to kind of, you're you're following you're following the Manson killings, which is already such a kind of deep, astonishing case, and then suddenly it leads into Jack Ruby and the Kennedy assassination. And yeah, how, how was what what was that experience like? I, I write in the book that when I had to call my agent, who at that point had been my agent for about four or five years, and in his mind it was three years too many. I should have written the book. Uh, when I told, I had to call him to say that, you know, that I've been looking into West and this possible uh, relationship with Manson at the Hague Clinic and, and how important that is. He said, absolutely. I go, well, you know, I've also proven because he had shown him the documents that West was working for MK Alter during that period. I said, you know, we can't now ignore West's relationship with Jack Ruby. He goes, what are you saying? And I said, we got to look at the JFK assassination. He goes, no, 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 you can't do that. And then, of course, after 15 minutes, I persuaded him that, you know, I couldn't keep that out of the book. But that probably added on another 10 years of reporting. Mm. So it was something that uh, was exciting, but at the same time daunting, you know. Mm. And I, I knew then that this was going to be a really long haul and took 20 years uh, to do. But it's hopefully mostly behind me now. And what was your conclusion of what the, the of the big picture of why the Manson killings happened and what the link was to these secret projects? Well, that's the thing. You know, I, I don't really like to say anything that is theoretical on my part. I, I like to present the information and lay out, 
you know, the facts that I was able to prove and let the readers come to their own conclusion, mostly because I haven't definitively proved that it was part of MKUltra, Chaos, COINTELPRO. Um, I think I make a pretty good case that, you know, the objectives of COINTELPRO and Chaos were to present hippies and, and, and the youth movement that was rising up against the government and demonstrating in the streets and getting larger and larger. And so much so that Lyndon Johnson pulled out of the race because he knew that he wouldn't be able to win in that climate. Um, that if they needed like a propaganda campaign to make these people look crazy and dangerous and completely untethered to reality, well, Charles Manson was a gift because those murders happened in, in uh, August of 69. And um, the original uh, police theories were that they were committed as part of a drug deal gone wrong or some type of ritualistic sex thing that went out of control. But then all of a sudden in December, they hold a press conference and announce that the murders were committed uh, uh, as as part of a plan to start a race war by a group of hippies, you know, at a commune in, in, in Spawn Ranch in Los Angeles and then out in Death Valley. Uh, and then all of a sudden on the front page of the papers is Charles Manson looking crazy with his eyes and, and the women followers, you know, uh, who look like, you know, any hippie you saw on the street with beads and long hair, young, you know, nursing babies saying, Charlie's our God, Charlie's our leader, you know, that couldn't have done a better job of dismantling and kind of ruining the peaceful image of hippies up to that point. Now they were dangerous, you know, people stopped picking up hitchhikers, people were scared of LSD and hippies and drugs and free love. And it really, um, well, Joan Didion said it famously how it ended the 60s. I wasn't the first to say that, but um, so that's, you know, that's where my book is going. I'm thinking of doing a part two and I have gotten a lot more information since the book came out about two years ago. That gets me closer and closer to providing something more definitive. Uh, I'm still reporting and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, there is just, just the sort of the symbolism of the Manson murders and that it does feel like that sort of full stop to yeah. the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it's when something sears through that clearly into the kind of public consciousness, it's it's not. And, and then the, the the case that you make, it, it does seem very, very convincing. Like, of course, there would be interest in this. Of course, there was this undeclared war going on throughout the 60s right, against right. the counterculture. Mm -hmm. um, you, this may sound like seem like a slightly um, left field suggestion, but have you heard of a of any of a process called family constellations? No. So there's different forms of constellation uh, work. It's sometimes done in business. Family constellations is basically based on the idea that um, secrets from the past in a family dynamic will play out in the present in a weird way. So a lot of the time, sort of whatever the patterns are that are playing out in your family or sometimes in your life. It's kind of a therapeutic process. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the idea behind it is that these influences from the past just play out and we don't quite understand why. And my sense is, and this comes really strongly through in your book, like I feel like in some way until America has some kind of reckoning with this kind of hidden history. Oh, right, yeah. I feel like it's going to continue to play out. Like there's so much... America is a kind of notoriously kind of paranoid society. There's a lot of different conspiracy theories, some of which are true, some of which are not true. And it's all kind of melded together in a, in a very, in a slightly paranoid way. Yeah. Um, that I have this strong sense that unless America has a kind of almost like a truth and reconciliation committee, where a lot of this stuff that happened at this absolutely seismic time in their past is, is accounted for and is brought out into the light, like in a way that I feel like the American psyche can't move forward. Um, well, it's interesting because we didn't talk about this beforehand and you don't know about it as far as I know, but there are a group of scholars, investigators who have started a truth and reconciliation organization where in, where are we now, September? I don't know how much I can say about this because I'm helping them a little bit, but um, I mean, I think they have a website 
Um, but uh, in, in October, they're hoping to come out publicly with a lot of their own findings, and they're going to uh, make a presentation, you know, in a press conference and a challenge to Congress to reopen the investigations of John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. And I'm kind of guessing those are the 60s crimes you're talking about that, you know, America, Kennedy, John Kennedy was really the loss of innocence because people just didn't believe the Warren Commission report. And it wasn't really till, I mean, Malcolm got killed, Martin Luther King got killed, Bobby Kennedy got killed. It wasn't really until 74 with Watergate that they were, I think the population was jolted as much as they had been by Kennedy, which they couldn't, nobody ever really pursued until after 74. So with Watergate, when you saw how high up, you know, right into the White House and Richard Nixon, crimes have been committed, you know, uh, which ended up forcing Nixon to resign. He would have been impeached and probably convicted and sent to prison. At that point, that's when people really started wondering, well, what happened in the 1960s that we weren't told about? And there were hearings, the Frank Church hearings, Kennedy NUA hearings into these secret programs and the possibility that they had been involved in high profile assassinations like this. They were always inconclusive. So this new group of people, and I, I know I can't name some of the people they've got affiliated with them, might have a chance now, we'll see, of getting this stuff reinvestigated. Um, they've got a lot of people who are specialists just in each one of those assassinations that have got new evidence that they're going to present. I'm not sure how much they're presenting, but keep an eye out for like late October, early November, when the, this announcement will come out. But it's funny that you just happened to come up with that on your own. When I, I only found out about this about a year ago when one of the architects of the group started getting in touch with me and we were trading information. Wow, that, that's really fascinating. It, it, and the argument is we can't go on, you know, <laughs> be a united nation unless we confront, you know, the crimes of, of the country that had been hidden and, and, you know, that whole, I guess, family consultation or whatever you call it. Yeah. 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 It, I guess it's just a formalized process for articulating something that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. like you look at you look at the kennedy assassination the um jfk assassination like that's you, the, the most important person in your society it's regicide it's it's sort of the the death of the king like those those right. kind of those kind of crimes are gonna are going to Continue reverberate to through history yeah. and they're going to mm -hmm. like that that creates a such a rift in terms of public trust Right. The fascinating thing about the, the family constellations model and how it works is that it doesn't matter whether like the secrecy in a way creates a kind of gravitational force is the is the argument. Right. That right. Even though even though people don't know what it is that's hidden, that hiddenness itself starts playing out in some <laughs> strange ways. And when the secrets are uncovered, you suddenly understand why certain people behave in certain ways, why certain mm. relationships were damaged. <laughs> And it's kind mm -hmm. of, yeah, it's, it, I guess it's also, as a, as a journalist, like sunlight being the best disinfectant is another kind yeah. of maxim that right, right, we live right. by. Yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned as well, and you, you dropped a really tantalizing hint at the end of the Rogan interview about the Bobby Kennedy assassination and Siran Siran. Yeah. Who's been in the news recently because there's the, right. the possible, I think has just been approved for parole. Right. Um, can, can you tell us anything about about that? I know it's probably for your next book, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really great investigators who have compiled a lot of amazing evidence, not just in the last few years, but all the way back to the 70s. Some of these guys are dead now, but they've left this stuff out in books and whatnot. And um, like you said, Sirhan has been approved for parole. It's up to the full parole board to vote. The originally, so he had a parole hearing about two, three weeks ago, and he passed the first process, which is the first time in you know the 50 or so years he's been in prison that he's been approved. Now the full parole board will decide, and if they say yes, he should be paroled, then it goes to the governor. And if our governor is still Gavin Newsom, we'll know that in a week. If he's not recalled, it'll be up to him. I'm pretty sure Gavin Neese, you know, he, the governor has the ultimate say. 
And even though on paper, um, Newsom is pretty, you know, liberal and, and, you know, and I would be inclined, I think, to believe that the parole board is correct and this guy has served his time and should be freed. I, in the climate now with what happened in the country with the last presidency, it would just backfire in such a big way. I don't think he wants to be the person to release Sirhan because he, he's very ambitious and I think he wants to be a president at some point. That would be used against him. And he's also had a couple Manson family members come before him, Leslie Van Houten uh, and Bruce Davis have both been approved for parole and he vetoed there. So I don't think he's going to release Sirhan. Um, that's part of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. They've got some real <coughs> serious uh, uh, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy assassination scholars who uh, have compiled evidence that there was a second shooter in, in the pantry when Robert Kennedy was killed, <coughs> excuse me, and that Sarhan had been hypnotized you know, by MK Ultra operatives to just be in there firing a gun, but not the actual precise killer who they've actually identified. Uh, and I, I look at probably what you're talking about, about what I, I think I told Rogan about was I did investigate that for about at least a year, maybe two years while I was doing Manson investigation, because it seemed like a crime that Jolly West had to have been behind. But I could never find a link between West and Sirhan. I found links between other people like West with Sirhan prior to the, the shooting, but not West. So that's why my collaborator and I decided to leave it out of the book because the book is already big and dense. And you can't just talk about the Bobby Kennedy assassination in a few pages and dismiss it. It's just too detailed and complicated. But I have one really great piece of evidence that I am, I, I've shared it with these other investigators that nobody else has found about the murder weapon and something really unusual that happened to it in between when the murder happened and 13, 14 hours later, that helps their, their case. So hopefully I'll be able, I'm even thinking of maybe doing a magazine article about it just to get it out there in, in the public um, at some point soon. Yeah, I can't be the only one who watched the Rogan interview and heard you kind of hinting at some of these other pieces of evidence. I've never seen the Rogan thing. You know, you do those. I mean, I've done a few of these. That one was, I think, three hours long. Mm -hmm. And I just don't like watching myself talk about this stuff. And I watched the first five minutes and the last few minutes. But I, I can't remember what I talked about that or, you know, so. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't be the only person watching it and hearing you kind of drop all these fascinating um, hints of, of stuff that you found out about the, Kennedy, the Bobby Kennedy assassination. I'm praying that you've got it written down somewhere safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> it seems like incredibly important work. Yeah. Um, you, you said in the Rogan interview, you're never kind of concerned for your safety. Is that is that true? Do you, 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 never, you never kind of... Well, no, I wasn't. I was... Um... Around 20, 2006 until about 2015. 2006 was when I showed Vince Biliosi, the prosecutor, my, my evidence that he had suborned perjury and, you know, committed all kinds of prosecutorial crimes. From that point on, I was scared of him. <laughs> you know, I had been prior to that because I had learned just how dangerous he was. Outside of his um, participation in this Manson case, he had done some horrible things that I outlined in the book before, before that even and after. I mean, he was basically a criminal and dangerous. And he had told me what he was going to do to me, you know, in that first meeting. So, yeah, I was scared of him, um, but uh, never really. I mean, I, sometimes I wonder and a lot of people are worried for me, but, I, you know, if you live like that, you're never going to get anything done. And, and so Buliosi died in 2015 or 16 or so. Um, and I, I actually was very disappointed. I wanted him to be alive when the book came out to, you know, have to defend himself. And I was really looking forward to that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was never really genuinely frightened. I got threats from, you know, drug people who were operating in the 60s who I interviewed and was going to expose their stuff. I got threats from Manson's people and followers of his and stuff. But that stuff was silly, you know. I mean, most of the people were old men at that point or women. But Bugliosi was powerful up until his death even. And he was 
somebody I took really seriously. And I think he would have gone to any limits to stop the book from coming out. He did. He tried. I mean, he sent a 30 some page letter to my publisher threatening lawsuits and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And given how we just framed it as the essential, maybe it's kind of essential that America does reckon with this part of its past. Mm -hmm. Given that, were you disappointed with the lack of real follow-up for the book? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, it, it, I naively thought that there would be, you know, repercussions and I can't remember if I talked about this on Rogan, but there were, I don't know how much I can say about this. All right. So the New Yorker was going to do a big piece on uh, what I, what I found out and the reporter spent a year basically kind of retracing my steps and then going to experts with my conclusions. And I never saw the piece, but it got dumped and he was really disappointed. Uh, I don't know the reasoning why, why it never ran. He said that basically I would have loved that because all the experts said I was right on the money with my conclusions. Mm. And then the same thing happened recently with the LA times. And um, I'm not sure that it's completely killed yet, but uh, there was a great reporter who uh, actually a year and a half now she'd been, I actually shouldn't say much more about this if it's still in play there, but it should have come out six months ago. And I keep getting different reasons for why it hasn't. And now I'm not hearing anything. And I try not to be paranoid about that stuff, but it's happened more than once now. And these were exactly the kinds of articles I expected, you know, especially, you know, Los Angeles is, you know, where the massing crimes were heard and were prosecuted and really played out in the media first. So um, I, I was surprised about that, but I, I guess I shouldn't be so surprised. I don't know. I'm working with a documentary filmmaker now. And we're pretty close to agreeing on everything and and he's great and very high profile and, and if i do something with him i think there will be repercussions because when he does something people pay attention i won't ask you that is then You've- i'll tell you after <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i i mean do you have any any sense of why those those pieces didn't go through because you do talk about how in the book, you made sure that there was, you provided evidence for all of your claims and there was plenty in there that if it was incorrect, you would have had a lot of people suing you or kind of yeah. pushing back against against them. Well, it's funny, the latter one, the LA Times, um, when, does, when does this thing air or whatever? It's going out tomorrow, probably. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, well, do you have an audience in the United States? Some people watch it in the States. Okay. Um, I was going to get in touch with the LA Times person and say, really, seriously, what's up now? You know, this yeah. is crazy. Because I haven't talked to that individual for, I don't even want to say their gender, but about three months. And I really do like that person. Mm-hmm. And that person seemed really stunned that, let's say they, they're not transgender, but I don't want to reveal their uh, but let's say they, that they kept getting a runaround from the people they worked with at the times. So yeah, that's probably all I should say about it. But um, do you think it's just that the the mood music around, like it is, it, it's an extraordinary story that you you're telling. Yeah, and it, it is a kind, of, it is a kind of conspiracy bingo to anyone who's <laughs> who's kind of alert to to the, the the way that a lot of these topics have been stigmatized in the past. Do you think that that's right. the main reason? I'll say even more that I shouldn't say that. The thing is, this got greenlit by the paper. It's got notes by the paper it's editors, and it was supposed to run last spring. And then all of a sudden, the person was ghosted who wrote it, who has a relationship with the LA Times. And unless that person has been told something since I last talked to them, they're, they're still being ghosted. But I think I'm going to email them right after this. Uh, So I can ask them, um, you know, what their latest excuse was for not running a story that was finished and ready to go and should have been pretty explosive because I actually did read that when I fact checked it with the person. And I was really excited about it coming out because it was going to do everything you just said. It was going to ask 
why nothing, it was actually asking why nothing had been done since the book came out when I pretty, you know, concisely and, and directly exposed serious criminal activity within the prosecution, prosecutor's office of, uh, yeah. of Los Angeles. Because that's the other thing. I mean, you don't need to go into the 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 issues of MK Ultra or oh, yeah, it's not even in the piece or any of that. Like yeah. there was there was enough that you uncovered just related to the yeah. the inconsistencies or the irregularities in the trial and what that meant in terms of the what yeah, yeah. what that meant for the prosecution. I mean Bulliosi's co-prosecutor, Stephen Kay, who worked the case with him, when I presented this information to him in 2005, he, he was so shocked. He said this stuff could get them all new trials. And he was the last person in the world I expected to announce to me on tape, it's in the book, that everything I showed him, he didn't know happened, he couldn't believe happened, and had so upset him because he said, I thought I knew everything about this. He did all the parole hearings for 30 some years after until he retired. And he said, this changes everything. And he goes, this could get them all new trials. Um, and that's kind of what the person at the LA Times angle was, you know, should some of them have new trials? Should this information play into their parole hearings? The ones who are still, you know, there's four of them who still have parole hearings, sometimes once a year, depending on their age, sometimes twice a year. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'd like to see, you know, something happen, you know, also, I, I, yeah, I'm saying too much now. Anyway, yeah. So we'll see what the good question. <laughs> yeah. And what's your biggest regret about the investigation? Is it a sort of missing piece of evidence that you really wanted to stand up or? Oh, so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I really wanted to get an eyewitness. I mean, eyewitness accounts are always hard to use if you get them 50 years later because people's memories are fallible. And people want to think they were present when something, you know, important happened and saw something. I wanted to get a paper on paper, a record of West and Charlie Manson being in the same room at the same time at that clinic. It's very likely they were, you know, because Manson was there a few times a week for from about June until off and on November, December of 67. And that's exactly when West was there doing what he was doing. Uh, and the closest I could get was the people that worked there said, well, we all knew Charlie. We all saw Charlie. You know, you wouldn't miss him because he came in, followed by these women who weren't who didn't speak unless he gave them permission to speak. And he was fascinating. We were all fascinated. And Wes's colleague who had come out to San Francisco, but Wes was on sabbatical when he did this, a guy named James Allen said, yeah, we, I was around Charlie all the time, but I can't tell you. He said Charlie had to have had encounters with him. But I wanted something on paper. I couldn't get that. That was one of the, there were a lot of things that I wished I had found, but didn't. I would love to have found a relationship between West and Jack Ruby before Jack Ruby shot Oswald, you know, uh, but I couldn't. Uh, so I wouldn't ever even theorize that West had anything to do with possibly programming Ruby. But I also have an open mind to it. Mm. What? Why do you believe that Ruby was programmed? Just because the because of the. Well, I mean, if you looked at what music. happened with Sirhan, um, you know, Sirhan had a missing period. Uh, he had a he, he worked at a racetrack as a stable boy, and he I remember he was kicked in the head or fell off a horse. Uh, was hospitalized briefly, and then his parents said he disappeared for like three or four months. They didn't hear from him. They didn't know where he was. When he came back, he was very different. And then within a month, he was standing in the ambassador pantry shooting a gun at Robert Kennedy. Um, when Ruby shot Oswald, he was tackled, you know, by the police after he had shot him. And he said, I'm Jack Ruby. Why, why are you doing this? How am I? He, he claimed to have no memory of pulling the gun up and shooting um, Oswald. And that's in the police reports. His first defense was his lawyer, Melvin Bell. I said he had an epileptic fit and had amnesia once the fit occurred. Um, but 
researchers, including myself, have been able to prove that he it was a premeditated shooting. He stalked Oswald. He tried to kill him two or three times from the assassination of Kennedy to, I think it was three days later. He kept going back to the police station. Um, there's a whole, yeah, that's too detailed to get. It's too within the weeds now, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if um, Ruby had been tampered with prior to this, but I looked for it and I couldn't find any evidence of it. Mm. And what is your, you're working on your next book now? How long do you think that might be until it comes Not, out? What's, what's going to be in it? <laughs> well, I, I got the best collaborator in the world when I got this guy, Dan Pippenbring. Uh, about two years before the book came out, he came on board and, you know, we turned it out in about a year and a half. Um, I know if I did it alone, it would take another 20 years again. I'm not going to live that long, probably. Uh, he wants to do it. So I'm just telling him, uh, you know, give me a few more months. I, I want more persuasive information. I don't want to write a book just to capitalize on the success of the first. I got some really good stuff that we didn't put in the first and stuff that I found out since. But if if it happens, and I think it's more likely than not to happen, hopefully we'd have it out within three to five years. And it would be a follow up and a continuation of the stuff we found, but not a rehashing of what we found, but only new stuff, you know, that's, you know, relevant. It was a 20 year process to put together the book. How do you, and it's what, two years now? So how, how do you feel kind of now looking back um, on the publication and the aftermath? Well, it feels good. You know, I mean, it, it was disappointing when the book came out. It got some attention. It sold okay, you know, but it wasn't until Rogan decided that you know, he wanted to promote the book and have me on the show. I shouldn't say he wanted to promote it, but it was a huge promotion because he's got this audience. And that changed, you know, the game for the book. And unfortunately, it happened right when COVID was really kicking into gear. So I hadn't even been on the show. He had only announced it like a week before I was on. And the book immediately sold out on Amazon and in the bookstores. So we, the publisher couldn't restock Amazon or the bookstores because the printing plant, uh, plants closed. There were cases of, of books available, but they couldn't be shipped because they weren't essential. So um, we weren't able to capitalize on that. Uh, and uh, But it did, you know, when the paperback came out about six, seven months later, it did fantastic. And the best thing about Joe is uh, he is kind of obsessed with it. And if you, I didn't really follow him. I never watched him before. I knew who he was, but I didn't pay attention. And I have a friend who's a good friend of his. but. Um, the kind of, you know, every single part of the book has a different reason to interest him. You know, drugs, cults, anti-government, you know, he, he, he's, let's just say, very broad-minded in his interests. So it was perfect for him. And uh, the best thing is, you know, he has guests on ever since I was on in April of 2020. And he'll bring the book up uh, like every other week or so, uh, and he'll ask the guest, and I've got all these compilations of, that, that have been sent to me, have you read this book? And most of them haven't. So then he'll repeat, he'll tell the whole, you know, synopsis of the book, and then our sales go crazy again. So keep going, Joe, I'm happy. <laughs> awesome. That's a great story. And the book yeah. definitely deserves that. Um, if anyone hasn't read it, then definitely get hold of a copy. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm really looking forward to what you do next. I hope it's sooner than than five years. <laughs> yeah, but, maybe. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you so much for joining me, Tom. It, sure. It's a real la labor of love to produce it. So it really comes okay. through in the, in the reading. Thank, thanks for having me, David. It was fun. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho hamilton John Viveki, and more. Improve your sensemaking. 
develop your sovereignty and join a wider community looking to do the same.